should have to do. Okay, thank you. All right, let's now go on to uh, paragraph 9, please. 9 and 10. Jehovah also gave the people of the Assyrian capital of Nineveh an opportunity to respond to his warning. His word occurred to Jonah, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim against her that their badness has come up before me. Nineveh was deemed fit for destruction. However, when Jonah declared the message of doom, the men of Nineveh began to put faith in God, and they proceeded to proclaim a fast and to put on sackcloth from the greatest one of them even to the least one of them. Their king rose up from his throne and put off his official garment from himself and covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the ashes. The Ninevites responded to Jehovah's molding efforts and repented. Consequently, Jehovah did not cause the calamity. Okay, 9 and 10, how did the Ninevites respond to divine warning? How did they respond to divine warning? Brother Soto, please. Uh, they, uh, when they got the message, they responded uh, right away because they know that they were deep fit uh, for destruction because uh, uh, Jonah told them that uh, this was a message uh, from Jehovah God. So they turned around and they were, and they were spared. Very good, thank you. This uh, <laughs> reputation of Nineveh or its, uh, what was it? Famed before, what was it famed before? Brother Allen? Nineveh was a very uh, brutal uh, uh, nation. They dealt with their enemies very harshly, uh, beheading them, parading them around, uh, the heads around. They were just, just a brutal people. Yes, they made killing a sport. And uh, they were a bloodthirsty nation, as it were. Sister Kelvin, please. The city was known as a city of bloodshed, so when they did repent and they put on faith, from the greatest one, the king, all the way down to the lowest slave, and it's interesting here in Jonah 3, 5 through 10, it mentions here that even the domestic animals, they even put sackcloth on them to show the depth of their repentance, that they truly were repentant, not just as a show, but from the heart. And even though they weren't God's name people, they allowed themselves to be molded by Jehovah by repenting of their badness. And Jehovah did spare the city at that time. I'll go on to paragraph 11. Being a chosen nation had not excluded Israel from discipline. The Ninevites, on the other hand, were not in a covenant relationship with God. Still, Jehovah had his message of judgment declared to them and showed them mercy when they proved to be like malleable clay in his hand. How vividly these two examples show that Jehovah our God treats none with partiality.
When the people of Nineveh repented and turned around from their bad way, the Bible says, the true God felt regret over the calamity that he had spoken of causing to them, and he did not cause it. The Hebrew term translated felt regret actually pertains to a change of attitude or intention. Jehovah's attitude towards Saul changed from selecting him as king to that of rejecting him. This change occurred not because Jehovah had erred in choosing Saul, but because Saul acted without faith and became disobedient. The true God felt regret in the case of the Ninevites. That is, he changed his intention regarding them. How comforting it is to know that Jehovah our potter is reasonable and adaptable, gracious and merciful, willing to change his course based on positive changes that erring ones make. Okay, paragraphs 12 and 13, our A portion. Why does God, excuse me, what does God alter his course when individuals respond to his mold? Well, we can see here that um, because Jehovah is reasonable and adaptable, he um, is willing to um, see the way that people are responding to his molding. So when it mentions that um, here with uh, Saul, at one point he actually felt regret that he had caused him to reign. And we had read that, um, that instance where he did not really follow to the letter what Jehovah had asked him to do. But even previously to that, Saul had offered up a sacrifice because he didn't want, he was tired of waiting for Samuel to come. So he had a reputation almost of not obeying Jehovah or not doing things Jehovah's way. So it wasn't really the first time he had not listened. But Jehovah, you know, was giving him opportunities, but once he finally kept not listening to Jehovah. That's when Jehovah had to finally um, feel this regret about him not actually accepting the molding that Jehovah was trying to um, do through him. Okay. All right, our B portion. Jehovah's feeling regret meant what in the case of Saul? I really appreciated how they brought this out, that um, Jehovah's attitude towards Saul in removing him as king and being sorry for what, you know, had happened with Saul wasn't because Jehovah made a mistake. And uh, a lot of times we see that. We think, uh, oh, why did Jehovah appoint this one? Did Jehovah know that this was going to turn out like this? No was up to Saul, it was, uh, it's our responsibility, our mistake, not Jehovah's. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> let's now go on to our next paragraph and subheading, let us not reject the discipline of Jehovah. Jehovah molds us today primarily by means of his word, the Bible, and his organization. Should we not accept whatever counsel or discipline we receive through these means? Regardless of how long we have been baptized or how many privileges of service we have received, we should continue to respond to Jehovah's counsel, allowing it to shape us into vessels for an honorable use. Paragraph 14 now, the A portion. How does Jehovah mold us today? How does he do that? Sister Parker. Well, Jehovah Moses by means of his words the Bible and also by his organization today. That's really good, thank you. The B portion, she would respond to God's molding. For the Sunday Well, Jehovah Moses Give out when you're corrected by him. 
not easy to take discipline. Depending on our nature, it may be very difficult to accept discipline from Jehovah. But it says there, do not belittle it. Don't look at what Jehovah says as a small consequence. Uh, it's important that we accept our discipline. And sometimes the discipline is a little severe. Uh, there in 6 it says he scourges everyone he has as a son. That's a severe beating. Sometimes the discipline we get from Jehovah is painful to us. It's hard to handle. But we have to accept what Jehovah knows best. And whatever it is, we need to uh, uh, let him mold us. Thank you. Okay. Moving on now to our next paragraph. Paragraphs. Paragraphs 15 and 16. Some discipline may come our way in the form of instruction or correction. At other times, though, we may need discipline because we have not done what is right. Such discipline may involve the loss of privileges. Consider the example of Dennis, who was serving as an elder. He fell into wrongdoing because of poor judgment regarding business matters, and he was privately reproved. How did Dennis feel the night it was announced to the congregation that he was no longer serving as an elder? I had an overwhelming sense of failure, he says. Over the past 30 years, I had many privileges of service. I had been a regular pioneer, had served at Bethel, had been appointed as a ministerial servant, and then as an elder. I had also just given my first talk at a district convention. Suddenly, it was all gone. 